um, Ephesians, of course. Um, hmm. Lost my notes momentarily there. Uh, so Ephesians chapter 3 uh, is where we're at. New chapter. Uh, Ephesians 3. And um, tonight we're going to do verses 1 through 2 and including verse 6. So the first six verses. Uh, again, which I shall um, read out to you. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, would how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So, um, there's, there's a great kind of connection in, in the book of Ephesians, right from chapter 1 all the way through. These themes run um, pretty much throughout uh, uh, this epistle, and, um, and, and this is why Paul says for this cause so he's referring to something else isn't he uh it's funny really in a way to me that the chapter starts like this for this cause because it's kind of like then you've got to kind of look back to the previous to the previous chapter and uh, and and you've got to ask yourself well what cause well the cause is this idea that we are being built together uh, both jews and gentiles in christ to form this this household uh, and and as as we looked at last week uh, this temple of God that we're we're fit together as lively or living stones to build up this um, this temple of praise to God and Paul is saying it's for this reason this it's it's because of this um, for this cause that he is now a prisoner of Jesus Christ. For you Gentiles. And that might seem a bit weird because um, he is imprisoned by the Romans. You know, I know that, well, why would the Romans care, you know, that Paul was bringing together Jews and Gentiles? You know, there are no kind of strong, st strong feelings about that. The Romans were very inclusive of all kinds of religions. In fact, it was kind of like a bit of a hobby of theirs. Uh, they, they would they would adopt religions and gods and, and, and deities of whatever country they they absorbed into the Roman Empire. So they weren't, you know, it's a strange thing to say that it's for this cause that I am now a prisoner. Uh, but when you look at it, uh, the history of Paul's life, it actually makes sense. And we can make sense of it uh, if we go to Acts chapter 25. So um, Acts chapter 25 and verse, uh, verse 1 says, Now when Festus was come into the province after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him and desired favour against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying him wait in the way to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself would depart shortly thither. So, so what it's saying is the Jews wanted to kill Paul. Why? Well, because of what he's doing, because he's bringing together Jesus. He, he's, set, he's teaching, isn't he, that that partition, that separation that was there uh, should be removed. Because now that Christ has come, um, the, the, the law is fulfilled in Christ. And now there is no need for that, that separation between Jew 
and Gentile. And, and that is such an affront to those Jews who don't believe on Christ that they actually want to kill Paul for that. And so, um, again, we'll see uh, just an another little bit of, of the kind of how strong those feelings were. Uh, go to Acts 21. So in, in Acts 21, um, we see Jewish Christians, including Paul, um, and they, they, they are fulfilling a vow and therefore entering into the temple. And this is what happens when they enter into, uh, enter into the temple. Uh, so this is verse 27. And when the seven days, that's the seven days of their, um, their sort of purification, I think it was from the vow. When the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were in Asia... Uh, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is <laughs> where King James was at. Help! He's here! It's that Paul character. Help! Um, this is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. And then it explains why they're saying that. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. So, so they're very uncomfortable with this idea of Jews and Gentiles uh, being brought together. And Paul, of course, who, was, who had been a Pharisee, uh, bringing them together. And they're assuming, oh my goodness, he's even brought them into the temple, uh, these Gentiles. Uh, and so they want to actually... Uh, they want to actually kill um, Paul. As we read on, it says, And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. Uh, and as they went about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band and all Jerusalem was in uproar. So it's a big chaos, a riot ensuing uh, because of the appearance of Paul. And so, you know, you can imagine what it's like to be Paul and like wherever you go, the Jews are kind of attacking you physically. Uh, and again, Paul, Paul makes reference to this in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 to 25. Paul says, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one, so 39 lashes, we would say. Uh, thrice I was beaten with rods, once was I stoned. So stoning, of course, being the Jewish punishment for uh, blasphemy. So this is not the Romans who are stoning Paul, you know. So so you can kind of see really why why Paul is is has had enough of this. Why he's weary of it. And so we know that what happens is when he, he speaks to Felix, he speaks to Festus, the, the governors, and eventually he appeals to Caesar because, of course, as well as being a Jew, he's also a Roman citizen. And so he's like, right, well, I appeal to Caesar because he doesn't want to go back to Jerusalem. Because he goes back to Jerusalem, he's going to be killed more than likely. And so he appeals to Caesar. And, um, and, and, this, and this is why eventually he becomes this prisoner of of the Romans because because the Jews were quite happy to collude with the Romans uh, or anyone else for that matter in order to achieve uh, their objective uh, and which was to kill Paul so this is called Ephesians itself is called one of the prison epistles you know he wrote several of his letters uh, from prison um, and so Paul is making reference at the beginning here of chapter three Paul uh, for this cause, for this reason, the bringing together of Jew and Gentile in Christ, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. So he's saying it's because I open this gospel and, and all that goes with that to the Gentiles. And therefore I'm a, a marked man. They want to kill me for it. Um, so he says, uh, he says that this is a, a, a special dispensation of grace to you ward that's how the king james puts it we would say toward you 
yeah to you ward toward you and it's it's this dispensation of uh, grace towards you helpful to understand that there as far as i'm concerned two dispensations um that is the old covenant and the new covenant uh, and so when we talk in terms of dispensations he's dispensing the gospel of grace right he's dispensing it he's giving it out uh just just to kind of clarify i'm not talking about dispensationalism which is a kind of a type of theology uh which has i think it's up to about eight dispensations which to me is just like highly confusing you know as far as i'm concerned there are only two dispensations the old covenant and the new covenant and the new covenant fulfills the old covenant so in the end we're just left with one does that make sense? And, and I hope I've shown that actually, not only through our studies in Ephesians, but also through our studies in Romans, that Christ comes and fulfills all, all that kind of um, uh, uh, the Mosaic law uh, and so on. Um, so, so, so going back to Ephesians uh, chapter three, then we haven't got very far in it, have we? Um, verse three says how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as i wrote afore or before in few words whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of christ so so he says it's by revelation this is an important thing to understand with the apostle paul he doesn't go and see all the other apostles and they kind of teach him the gospel that paul preaches is given by revelation from the risen christ that's amazing i mean paul does then go later on and he speaks to peter and he speaks to um, um james and, and others you know about the gospel he preaches and then he comes away and he's satisfied that yeah he's preaching the same thing that they're preaching but this is he receives it by revelation i mean paul is in a way a unique case you know he's got a unique ministry uh, but he is being taught it by christ himself and he says god gave the knowledge of the mystery of christ namely salvation by faith in christ that's the mystery he's talking about okay and it's a mystery because prior to the new covenant prior to christ coming uh, and and things like the Sermon on the Mount where Christ gives his teaching and so on prior to that um, it, it, it had remained a, a mystery we know you know we know that salvation is according to the word and salvation is by faith but the idea that it was faith in Christ um, was, was not fully shown it's partly shown but it's not fully shown as it would be through the new the new covenant uh, so so Paul's mystery is the salvation by faith in Christ for Jews and Gentiles. And again, that's the other one. There's that uh, verse where, where uh, uh, the, the Jewish Christians show great surprise and delight that, wow, so now the Gentiles are coming to faith in Christ. And that for, you know, that we're like, yeah, of course. But, but you know, you imagine when the, the gospel was first preached and when Christ had first come, it's like a Jewish thing, a very Jewish thing. And now it's kind of broadening out and it's like, well, hey, Christ is for everybody. That's amazing, you know, and that was like a mystery that they didn't understand. And Paul says, he, said, he talks about his mystery, he says, as I wrote before or as I wrote before in a few words. And what he's doing is making reference to earlier on in Ephesians. Uh, so so let's let's look again. Ephesians 3 verse 3, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Uh, and then if we go to Ephesians 1 and, um, and verse 9, Paul says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. So, so that's what he's making reference to. This idea, Christ is going to gather together 
all things and, and even expands it, doesn't it say, and even those who are in heaven and those who are on earth. So it's like this is the church, right? It's Jew, it's Gentile, it's living, it's dead. It's like we all come together into this one family in Christ. It's those who are in Christ. And what I wanted to say right at the beginning when we were studying this epistle, this is about corporate election. We, us, they, you know, it's this kind of language that Paul uses right the way through uh, Ephesians chapter 1, that you become part of this family, you're adopted in the family of God. Uh, so, Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, so he says in verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the spirit so this is an interesting verse and and i'm not i'm not gonna you know how would you say it I'm, I'm i'm willing to kind of you know uh waver on this but it's just interesting to me it's just an interesting point that he says that in the ages past or in in other ages rather so in time past this was not made known to the sons of men you know in other words it wasn't made fully known we didn't really fully understand it. But now, so now he's saying, now he's talking about in the new covenant, right? Now, when Paul is writing, now it's revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So, it's revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets. Now, we had that, that phrase before last week. Apostles and prophets. You remember when it talked about the foundation of the church being the apostles and the prophets. But I think Paul's indulging in a little bit of wordplay here. So as Paul sometimes does. So on the, on the one hand we looked at the apostles and then the prophets of the Old Testament form the foundation. But now he says not in ages past but now it's the, the holy apostles and the prophets who are who are uh, revealing this this mystery this gospel of christ by the spirit so hmm, this is quite timely in a way because of course the revelation of the spirit has been the subject of or the theme uh, of the last um uh, the last two sermons that i've preached on sunday morning and and when you look at this and it seems to be saying this is something that's happening under the new covenant, you might be saying, well, hang on, prophets, aren't they in the Old Testament? Therefore, aren't they in ages, in other ages or ages in ages past? You know, so what's Paul saying? Well, let's let's look a little bit closer. So let's go to Acts. I say I'm not going to fall out with anybody over this, but I just I just they got me thinking about this one. Don't always have the answers, <laughs> but I like to uh, I like to ponder these things. So Acts twenty one. Okay, so this is new new covenant, right? Uh, Acts twenty one verse eight says, and the next day uh, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven so he's one of the the seven um uh deacons really is what you would call them i guess uh those who were chosen um and uh, uh, of which stephen was one and it says uh he was one of the seven and he abode with him and the same man had four daughters virgins which did prophesy now then um so does that mean that there were prophets in the New Testament? Well, uh, on Sunday I talked about how prophesy can also mean teach, right? But Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.12, But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, uh, but to be in silence. Now, there are exceptions to that silence, and there are several and, and, and some of them come in 1 Corinthians 11, 5. Every woman that prayeth or prophesieth. Follow me on this. Okay, so a woman can't teach, 
but a woman can prophesy. And um, so, so a woman can pray out loud. She can prophesy out loud. There wouldn't much point prophesying inwardly, but she can prophesy out loud uh, for the edification of others. And uh, uh, the most obvious thing that a woman can do, Psalm 150, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Do you have breath? Okay, praise the Lord then. You know, you can praise him in song. You can praise him in work, just in words. We can praise him in prayer. You can praise him in prophes by prophesying. Uh, and so a, fur a further cl uh, clarification, I think, that there is a difference. There can be a difference between teaching and prophecy. And there can be it can be a thing, if you like, for the new covenant. In other words, you can prophesy whether you're a man or a woman. And it's it, it is a new covenant thing is if we look in Ephesians 4. If it's not, uh, if we're not getting ahead of ourselves. So Ephesians 4 and verse 11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So, so it makes a distinction there between prophets and and teachers suggesting that maybe prophecy in the New Testament is can be just that it can be teaching, but it can also be actually foretelling uh, future events or, or God, God communicating something uh, that is going to happen. So. Um, the the that it's the holy apostles and um, the prophets. So the, this gospel has been more, more fully um, revealed than it ever had been before. And it's revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Uh, and what they're revealing is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So just a couple of things. I'm, I'm going to finish off shortly. Um, but I just want just a couple of things that we, we need to kind of establish here. Holy apostles. That's good, isn't it? it? It's, you know, some Christians misunderstand what Paul was like because usually because of a misunderstanding of Romans 7. Right. And I've heard I, I, I even used to say it myself. I used to say, oh, well, you know, Paul says that you know, he wants to do good, but he can't. He can only do evil and you know, even when he tries to do good, he does bad things and, and, and you know, he, he just can't help it. He's like a, he's a hypocrite and at least he's honest, at least he admits that. But that is a misreading of Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, as I've said before, is about Paul talking about himself under the law. That, you know, he knew the right thing to do because the law had told him. But how to perform that, he says, I find not. So he's saying, I know the right thing to do, but I can't do it. And then he says, uh, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me uh, from this body? So, so you know, I'm in this wretched state. Who's going to deliver me? And then it says, thanks be to God through Christ Jesus. So it's like, that's your deliverance. There is a deliverance from that. And so a lot of Christians think that Paul is this kind of hypocrite, this wretched man, but he's not. His sanctified life is a life of holiness. You know, Paul, once he was saved, pursued holiness. And we also are to pursue this holiness, hence holy apostles. The second thing um, that I want to show from this as well, and, and again, it's been a theme all the way through, but I, I feel that it should be touched upon here because it's in the text. Fellow heirs. OK. That's Jews and Gentiles. Fellow heirs of the same body. Because, as Galatians says, Galatians chapter 3, right at the end there, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one. 
in Christ Jesus. So, so there's that bringing together, that fulfilment in Christ where we come together and this is the mystery that Paul is being persecuted for. This is the reason why uh, uh, Paul is suffering this persecution. This is the reason why ultimately that he's been imprisoned by the Romans is because he teaches this. He teaches this this removal of the partition between them and, and, and this just coming together in um, in Christ.